Tonight, I want to share with you something fascinating that you need to see and understand for yourself out of the Word of God. It's called Spiritual Testings. So if you're making notes, that's the title of our message tonight. It's called Spiritual Testings. And uh, I think you're going to find it fascinating to be able to discern the difference between, you know, what is God wanting from you, desiring for, what is he allowing you to go through or experience uh, so that you don't fall apart. Because sometimes, if you don't understand the process, you'll blame God for everything. Well, I don't wonder what happened. What am I going through this? Why is this going on? You know, where were you, God? I was in church last week. I even gave some money. What is this all about? You know, I even prayed two or three times last week. And yet, this is happening to me? Forget it. There must. And then the devil says, there must not really be a God. Or he doesn't care about you at all. Instead of us understanding spiritual testings. And that's where we're going to go tonight. Let's pray. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus. And you know, Lord, we haven't come to hear from a man or a woman. We haven't come to hear from a tall man, a short man, an old man, a young man. Well, that's silly. We haven't come to hear from a black man or a white man or a brown man. That's silly, Lord. We have come to hear from the teacher of the church who is the Holy Spirit. So welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us and heal us and strengthen us. Encourage us and guide us and guard us and direct us and motivate us to be all that the Father would have us to be, all that the Son paid the price for us to be, and all that the Holy Spirit empowers us to be, and God will give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' mighty name. And Lord, not only bless us, but all the churches that are preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that are our brothers and sisters, bless them also. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say, Amen. Amen. Oh, come on, we all say, Amen. Amen. There's this little, funny little verse in the Bible that says, iron sharpens iron. And I've often considered that as one strong person clashing with another strong person. And the two are like iron that sharpen each other, you know. And I, I, I have a different thought about that verse particularly is that the iron, that the first iron that sharpens the second iron is God and all of his magnificent strength that sharpens us for where we're at. And so the real iron God takes the, which is made from the planet Earth and sharpens it. And that's what we're doing tonight. I was, the other day, I don't know if you do this, some of us guys do this. Uh, I, 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 I like to go through channels, you know, it's one night. There was nothing really on television that was any good. And so I kind of flipped through the channels and Debbie comes in, you know, like every good wife and says, what are we watching? Uh, pick something. Why are we going from channel to channel? Uh, does any, does any, any woman know what I'm talking about? Does any man know what I'm talking about? I think we're all the same. It's like, you know, we're flipping through the channels. And I landed on this show. I don't even know the name of the show. It, I think it was called Forged in Steel. And, it, and what it is, is a, a, a contest with three or four guys who work as blacksmiths and sword makers and knife makers. And they take a piece of steel and they, they heat it up and they pound it and they trim it and they make a sword out of it and then they test the sword, you know. And it's, as I was watching it, I found it fascinating. I don't know if you've ever seen the show. It's one of those, you know, I don't know what channels, it was just there. And I watched it and they, you know, they got the steel and they heated it up and it was red and each one of the guys did the hard work and they pounded it and they grinded it and then they polished it and they shaped it and they made the handle. And when they were finished, they, 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 they would bring their completed sword up and then the sword had to be tested to see how good the sword was made. It was not only tested by its looks, uh, you know, it had a beautiful handle, it had a beautiful this and that, and it, been, it fit well in the hand, but then the sword was tested against, you know, some obstacles of some kind, you know, a bag of sand or a bag of something, whether it cut through and whether or not, in this, in, that really was to show the strength, if you will, of the sword. And I thought it was fascinating because as they were working hard to create these swords, these guys really, and gals even, really fell in love with what they were creating. 
And from the outside, you wouldn't know any difference at all. They were beautiful, beautiful handles, beautiful swords. They were sharp. But then it came time to find out who really not only had the most beautiful sword, but had the one that is the most effective and that's made the best with the strongest steel by testing it. And they would take it and they'd swing full bore at something to see if the sword was going to break or fall apart. Surprisingly, some of them broke. And they weren't as strong as the others, even though they were beautiful. And kind of as I was going from that, I was just rolling around in my mind how God oftentimes is like that sword maker where he takes us and he refines us and he pounds us and he puts us into a certain shape and man, he looks at it and he says, wow, that's beautiful. It's just perfect. And that's what he says when he looks at you and that's what he says just like the sword makers when he looks at me. If you can imagine, he says, wow, they're beautiful and I'm so proud of them. But then there's something going to happen in life just like that movie or just like that little television show, there's a testing going to go on to see whether or not the makeup of the steel is strong. You say, well, God made it. Wouldn't it be perfect if God made it? Since the fall, that means of man, where Adam and Eve partook of the tree of knowledge of good and of evil, there's been all kinds of characteristics that have gotten inside mankind of which no one can determine what it's really going to be like until it's tested. So God will allow, just like in that show, a testing at times for all of us to show whether or not we are able to stand up and how far we can go in believing and trusting and living out life for him and with him. And there's a testing ground throughout the entire scripture to see what our makeup is really all about. Did he forge us beautifully? Yes. Did he forge us hard? Yes. But sometimes the characteristics of the steel may not have had the qualities of other pieces and therefore it's not quite as strong. God wants to know what that is and he wants you to know how you're made up. So he allows, if you will, he allows you and I to be, if you will, spiritually tested. Now let me say this to you so you don't fall apart in understanding what I'm saying tonight. Not everything that comes against you is a test from God. It's not like God sends all the problems that we often have. We live in a fallen world. And this fallen and failed world is going to test you to see what you're made up of. And God doesn't have to do anything but sit back and realize that sometimes we're in the world, but we're not of the world, right? That's what scripture says. And he says to us, we're in this world, and sometimes just the way the world operates, you're caught up in the sins of the world, and those pressures will come in on your life. Now, how you handle them is that you will find yourself in a place of going through them or settling in them. And that's your call and your choice by whether or not what you do. With that in mind, I would like to share with you some important things that we need to see tonight. In our test, spiritual testing. In our spiritual testing, it's so fascinating for us to see this as number one, that God permits temptations in our life. And these temptations oftentimes are the pressures of life, even unjust pressures. Now, what I mean by that is sometimes, have you not ever said when pressures come on, that, guy, that's just not fair. And it's just unjust. Well, I've got news for you. We live in a not fair, unjust world. Because God is the only one that is just. His way is just and not the ways of the world. But we're conditioned by this. And oftentimes God will permit these pressures 
on our life. And when they come on our life, let me say this to you, listen closely, we're going to have to know how to get them off of our life. Listen, the pressure sometimes can be so horrific, you may never get over them, but with God, you will always get through them. Is anybody listening? And it's so important for us to see these things. Unjust will happen so that the just can be acted on. And we see that oftentimes we get so frustrated when something unjust happens to us and something is allowed to happen to us. After all, we're Christians and anybody told you being a Christian is going to be wonderful from that moment on, you're never going to have any problems again, is a dumb liar who doesn't understand scripture. Even Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. And Jesus said, you will have trials and persecutions for my sake. My goodness, he, uh, he warns us constantly through the scripture. Temptations, pressures of life, even though they may be unjust, are there, but there is an escape that God allows for us to see. And I was thinking about the verse that I find in my own life to be one of my favorite vi uh, verses. When pressures or things happen that are just crazy. Has anybody ever had just a crazy thing happen in their life? And you say, that's crazy. And then the next words out of your mouth is, where's God? Well, God's still there and it is crazy. And I've had that many times, but there's a favorite verse that I have found in the book of James. Stop right there. Let me just explain James to you. James, the half-brother of Jesus, the senior pastor of the Church of Jerusalem, under the times of persecution, he knew what problems were like. And his job is to write to a persecuted church to encourage them. And the first thing's out of James's mouth in chapter number one. But verse number two and verse number three says this, brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Count it all joy. He doesn't say, notice the word, count it all joy if you fall into various trials or problems, pressures of life. Christians, hear me. You will have problems, but God will give you the way of escape so that your problems are behind you and you come out ahead. That's what this is really all about. To think that you're like an ostrich sticking your head in the sand now that you're a Christian and you never have a problem is silly. Because he comes along, he says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various. Count it all joy is an accounting term. It means add up the facts. Add up the real facts about your life. Something horrible may have happened, but here's a fact, I'm saved and going to heaven. Something horrific must have, might have taken place. A loss that is a devastating, something that is absolutely crushing and unjust. But here's a fact. I'm born again and spirit filled and God loves me and he hasn't turned his back on me. And soon we will dust our feet off of the dust of this earth and the eastern sky will split and we're getting out of here. And if he doesn't get out of us out of here, man, guess what? We'll stay and we're gonna be in heaven anyway. We are the sons of God, the child of God. We are king's kids and the blessings below. Those are adding up the facts or you can sit and meditate the problem and then the problem gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Give the problem to God who loves to handle the problem and stop taking it back. Add up the facts. I like verse three. Verse three says, knowing, now here's the, notice what he says. Knowing the what? Testing of your faith. All the junk that's gonna come at you from the world is gonna test your faith to see what you do. Whether you complain, grumble, ball and squall, or whether you stand up and say, God, I hate every minute of this, but I know you're in control. I know that you'll take care of me. You'll always have, that's the answer. I'm gonna stand here and keep on going forward. If I fall, I'm falling forward, God. I'm not falling back. Come on, somebody. 
knowing that the test of it produces patience, and then you know how it goes from there. And patience produces and produces. Well, that's amazing. It's an amazing verse. I've got a bunch of these, so tonight I want to just keep on going. In our spiritual testing, number two. In our spiritual testing, number two, God permits man to suffer at times. You say, wait a minute, Pastor, I love everything you said until this point of suffering. I hate suffering. <laughs> suffering is probably the most interesting thing. Can you imagine the suffering of Paul the Apostle, just for a second? The suffering, if this guy, Paul, hadn't suffered, being beat, who loves that? I hate that. I, I mean, you know, God gives him a, a ministry of the dispensation of grace to tell the churches and start telling them about Jesus Christ and how he fulfills all the prophecies and the great ministry he has. And then God locks him up in jail. You say, what is that all about? The Romans locked me up in jail. This is terrible. But God allows him to be in jail. Why? If you want me to do the ministry, get me out of the, you want me to be a mouthpiece for you, get me out of jail. And, and of course, God does get him out. But while he was in jail, do you ever stop and think about it? Everything we're reading tonight, we read because Paul wrote it. And if he hadn't been in jail, he wouldn't have written it. I wonder where we would be today in the Christian church if it hadn't been for the writings of Paul. Huh? And so, my goodness, we know because of suffering, how God may at times permit it. It doesn't mean it's fun, doesn't mean it's exciting, but oftentimes we'll see it as a time. God may permit suffering, but faith won't let you stay in suffering. Listen to what I'm gonna to say to you. Failure is not the closed door, but opening a door to your future. And we see this oftentimes where we get so discouraged because something fails in our life and it's a closed door and we stop. But a closed door only means there's a greater future ahead. Keep going forward. Does anybody listen to what I'm saying? In Acts, the 16th chapter, in verse number 23, let's take a look at it. And it's talking about Paul and Silas. They hadn't done a thing wrong. They'd done everything right. But all of a sudden, the people, the, the police of that day, if you will, come in and they grab a hold of them and arrest Paul and Silas and then throw them in jail really for doing nothing except what God would have them to do. I mean, that's got to be a frustrating ministry. Sometimes you will do the right things and get wrong results, but God's in it. Are you listening to me? He may permit man to suffer at times, but he's always the relief of the man who goes through the suffering. Are you hearing me? And how we deal with this is very important. So here's Paul and Silas. And let me read it to you. And when they had laid, listen to the word, put them up for me. And when they had laid many stripes on them, this is Paul and Silas. Hey guys, here's translation for San Bernardino. When they had laid many stripes on them, when they beat the snot out of them. I mean, today, can you imagine being, you know, can you imagine the news and everything? If somebody goes to jail and somebody beats the snot out of you, well, in those days, they just beat the snot out of them. In fact, in San Bernardino language, let me just put it to you like this. Is that okay? We're maturing here and all adults. They just got the crap kicked out of them. And this is a horrible expression. Put many stripes on them and they threw them in prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Verse, if you will, 24. And having received such a charge, he put them in an inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. If you remember the story goes on, in the midnight hour, they're singing. I would have been complaining. I would have been saying, God, forget this ministry. It really stinks. Give it to Pastor Dan. I don't want it at all. This is like lousy. You know what I mean? I do all the right things and there's people come along and they're throwing me in prison. They're not only throwing me in prison, they're putting my feet in stocks and I'm, I'm broken and bleeding in the back and I'm just miserable and I'm, instead of complaining, these guys are singing. At times, what was it? God will allow suffering. But during the suffering, how you react is how you get out. 
And they were singing in the midst of suffering that most likely you'll never go through, that depth of suffering. And there's an earthquake, do you remember the story? And shook all the prison doors open. Do you remember that? Now, do you tell me what kind of an earthquake opens all the cell doors, listen to this, and then opens the stocks on their feet and opens and takes the chains off of their wrists? I know of no earthquake could ever shake enough to break the chains off of someone's wrist without breaking the arms off of their body. It's like crazy. I Right there, here's what I would have done. You would have too. This is obvious sign of God. I have suffered enough. He wants me out of this place. Adios, amigos. <laughs> Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, uh, the gate doors are open. The chains fell off my feet. The chains fell off my hands. I'm out of the stocks. Nobody's around. Bye-bye. It's obvious God, not to Paul. Paul stopped. He gets a word from God. Now listen to this. And he stays. And the jailer's about to kill himself because he knows they're going to, he's going to be killed when he finds out all the people are gone. And Paul says, hey, don't kill yourself. We're all here. Now somehow Paul convinced the other prisoners not to leave also. Don't tell me how that works. If you've ever been in jail, you ain't convincing them of nothing. But Paul, the, <laughs> you're laughing because you've been in jail. <laughs> but, but, you know, Paul, somehow all the prisoners stayed. Like, what's that all about? And he, the prisoner and all of his family get saved. Come on, guys. Suffering isn't the end of things. It's just a message God's saying that's difficult times that you need to go through. Number three, God permits, and I like this, requires hard tasks. Why doesn't God just make it easy? Why does it have to be a hard task? Debbie and I were, if you will, asked by God to build this church. Nobody had built a church in San Bernardino in 40 years. A lot of churches in the last 10 years have sprouted up. But none of them were here until we built the church. We didn't, we're not bragging, we're just telling you it was a graveyard for preachers and we, we had to build a church. And the funny thing about it, the task was set before us, but we had no way of building the church except if God did something miraculous. And so we just started to say, here we are, we're gonna build this church. And we just went through as if we had a lot of money. We didn't have any money. And we somehow got up enough to pay the land off, which was a couple of million dollars. And for, you know, people in San Bernardino to do such a thing, that in itself is like a miracle from heaven. We haven't seen that kind of money since we've been in the building. And so here we were, we paid the land off and then a, a lending company back in Minnesota ran into uh, and made a deal with them and they financed us. We brought a great general country. A year later, you're sitting in the results. And what a beautiful church it's been to host and explain and share the word of God over these last many years. But it was a hard task. I want you to know something. I like easy things. I want to do this. I'm like water. Whatever is the easiest, that's the way I want to flow. I don't want to have to do. But God oftentimes will permit and demand from us, require a very hard task for us to complete. And we completed that. Jesus is with his disciples, and it's a fascinating little story about Jesus. And he, uh, he sees this great multitude of people that he's around him, and he has absolutely no idea, at least the disciples have no idea how in the world they're going to feed these multitude of people that are following Jesus. And Jesus says a most interesting request and question to his disciples. And I take you to, to John, the Gospel of John, in the sixth chapter. 
And in verse, if you will, verse number five. And I'll put it up on the overhead. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing the great multitude coming towards him. He said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that they may eat? I mean, Jesus really cares about people, right? He wants to feed them, comfort them, take care of them. He sees something different, you know? Modern day pastors say, hey, there's a great multitude. Let's take up an offering. But Jesus says, how can we give to them? I love that, don't you? And he says these words to, in verse number five or six. He says, but he said this to test him. For he himself knew what he would do. And there's a testing there that's now going to demand something from his men in order to get the job done. And it's not going to be easy. It was one of those things that is very difficult. A tough task, if you will. Hard to get the job done. But Jesus knows how to get you through it. Number four tonight, as we do something of interest and, and we just look into our spiritual testings and understanding if you will, that God often requires deep sacrifice. Sacrifice is the giving of yourself for the betterment of someone else. The Christian faith requires that from beginning to end. When you got saved, you literally put your life on the block and said, it's no longer I that will live, but he will live in me. I give up my life. And a lot of times people don't realize that. They think it's all it is, is I just have to receive Jesus into my life and he'll be a part of my life. But Jesus requires that there be a sacrifice also on your part of giving up your life and living the life he wants you to live living the life that he has planned for you, living his way, not your way, living his desire, not your desire, living his uh, uh, future, not your future. And his is a whole lot better. That's the whole point of this. That's where trust comes in. So Jesus often requires sacrifice from us and something that is deep and meaningful and it's very difficult at times. Deep sacrifices that come from the soul and from the depths of our heart, something we truly desired, needed, and wanted, but we saw it as something that's so important. Deborah and I, uh, not bragging, but only showing this as a point of illustration for edification reasons, have lived our life in sacrifice. And yet we find ourselves abundant in every area of our life to the place where we're so abundant we don't even know what to do next and how to do it. You know that verse that says, I'll open the windows of heaven and pour out a, a blessing so much on you that you can't handle them. That's Malachi. I live literally that kind of a life because we have lived deep sacrificial lives of giving of everything for something greater. And that's God himself, including myself and everything that belongs with me. In Genesis 22, we find a tremendous truth where Abraham, the father of our faith, was asked to sacrifice something and it's a bizarre sacrifice and it's a bizarre sacrifice for a reason. The reason is to illustrate to you and I that sacrificial living is part of Christianity and part of a relationship with God. You never really give anything up without God giving back to you in greater measure. You cannot outgive God by any means. God will always give back to you in greater measure, but it takes faith to do it. And it faith takes a willing heart to want to live that kind of a sacrificial life, giving up something I really love and really want, really needs for the betterment of the kingdom of God. And a lot of times people don't understand that. But here in Genesis 22, Abraham literally, if you will, Verse number one says this. Now it came to pass that after these things, and I like these next words so that you might see it. And I highlighted it so you'd understand it. That God tested the steel of this man. You know what I'm saying now, don't you? 
iron was sharpening iron here. And God was testing the steel of this man and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am, Lord. He never expected to hear what verse number two was going to say. Verse two says it like this. And when he had said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, in whom you love. I should have literally highlighted the words, whom you love. How much do you love him? He'd waited almost a hundred years for him. He was a man way past his age of having children and God spoke to him. He had no son, he had no heir whatsoever. And God comes to Abraham and he says, Abraham, I'm gonna give you a son and your wife Sarah, who's past the age of having children, they're in their 90s. She's gonna have the child and it's like an amazing thing. And when this boy, Isaac, is born, this boy of the promise is born. Can you imagine the depth of his love for this son? An heir to everything he had ever done. And he loved him so much. And then God says the most bizarre thing. Remember, this is the first Hebrew, Abraham. He did not know the characters, characteristics, attributes, and nature of God. He did not know that the God you and I serve does not accept human sacrifice. He had come out of a culture where human sacrifice was very predominant. And when God spoke this to him, it had to shake him to his very core in the area of sacrifice. He said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, and go to land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering. Stop right there. A burnt offering is where you take something and you put it on the fire and you cremate it to dust. That the value of it was given to God and there's no value left on this earth. That's why you'll find that charcoal and dust from the fires and if you will, ashes have no value at all. And it was a burnt offering. It was the worst kind of a thing for a human to be confronted with. That meant he's going to have to drive a knife into his son and kill his son and lay his blood out and then burn him to ashes. And the very thing he loved is now going to be gone. The deepest sacrifice anybody could ever possibly be confronted with. A burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. And if you keep reading in those verses, you'll find he immediately got up and went, taking his son. Me, I would have said, God, I'll get around to it in two or three weeks, four months, year. Someday I might do that. Not him. Immediately, his steel was tested and he was proved strong enough to be the father of faith, the one who's written in the scripture. And you and I, this is written for you to understand that God in our testing often will test us with sacrifice. And most people say, when it comes to a deep sacrifice, no way, I ain't doing it. That's crazy. Forget it. That's not part of my life. But God literally is looking for people who will understand deep sacrifice. Tonight, we're looking at spiritual testings. And in our spiritual testing number five, God often requires hard journeys. The road is not a smooth road, but the road is a worthy road. Did you hear that? And God requires us to take journeys and do things that we don't want to do and go places we don't want to go and find ourselves in a place that doesn't even make sense. This is crazy. But the outcome is greatness because your steel has been tested and you've been proved to be something very special. I find it interesting in 
Deuteronomy, the eighth chapter, verse number two, God makes a statement to the children of Israel. They've been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years after coming out of captivity for 400 years. And God doesn't take him. He says, I want to lead you into the promised land. And he takes them through a wilderness area and he says, there's the promised land, go take it. And they come back and say, no way. We're not going to do it, man. There's giants in the land. We're like grasshoppers in their eyes. And they had no faith on this tough road, this journey that he was asking them to walk in. And they backed off for their own security. And here's this generation now coming up. And God writes these words for you and I to see about this spiritual testing. He says, and you shall remember the Lord your God, verse two, led you all out of the way for 40 years in the wilderness to humble you. That means to make you finally dependent on God. And uh, what are those words? I didn't hear it. What's those words? test you and to test you and to know what was in your heart, what kind of steel are you made out of, whether you would keep his commandments or not. A lot of times we don't realize how important it is for us to be tested on these tough roads that are actually required of us to go on. Why isn't it easy, God? Why isn't it smooth? If it's you, shouldn't it happen easy? Shouldn't it just fall in place? Everybody that's anybody in the Bible was tested. And anybody that's ever anybody never had it easy. Every single one of them were on roads of hard journeys. Number six tonight as we look at in our own spiritual testing is that God requires man to make hard choices. I hate hard choices. I want to make choices that make me feel good. I want to make choices that are pleasurable. I want to make choices that are absolutely, mm, I know it must be God because it's so wonderful. And yet God requires hard choices for us. When Debbie and I were young, there was a time when we were. (laughs) To me, she's still young. And we looked at each other facing a hard choice. I'll never forget, I remember exactly the place where we were driving. We were pastoring a little church in Lake Arrowhead, California called Lake Arrowhead Christian Fellowship. The church had 150 people on a good day. And it was difficult. And I remember driving with Debbie, we were faced with a hard choice about something. And I looked at her and I said, you might as well know me, Debbie. We were fairly newly married, maybe three or four or five years. You might as well know me. And you have to understand that I'm the type of person that I much rather fail at trying to do something great for God than to be safe and do something little and insignificant. And everybody can live a safe, insignificant life. It's your choice. Or you can be a person that says, I much rather fail trying than not try at all. And failing meant everything. It meant bankruptcy. It meant the loss of a home, a loss of everything. It meant not paying our bills. It meant not having a car. It meant everything in those days. And we've lived our lives that way. That's how we got into this building. Because I said again later on, I much rather fail than not try to do something great for God. And the devil is going crazy at both of us saying, now I got you. All, you preach that faith stuff. You preach all that, you know, God will come through. He won't come through. You're going to be showing up as a failure. And my whole mind at times was exploding. And God requires man to make hard choices. It's in those hard choices that you make that define the texture of your steel. 
And I'm here to tell you tonight, you're sitting in the seats of a hard choice. This church is probably worth $65 million. We only owe a few million on it. This year or next year, we're going to burn that mortgage. And we're not going to owe anything. And generation after generation, like you saw Sunday with our pastor, who's going to preach the word of God, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where hundreds got filled with the Holy Ghost and hundreds got saved. My goodness, that's a hard choice. Or we could be like other churches and just be safe. We're not going to do it. David has a son named Solomon. He takes over the kingship from David as he's gotten older. In 1 Kings, the third chapter, at Gideon, the Lord appears to Solomon at night in a dream. And God says these words to Solomon. It was a test. Ask what you shall Ask what you shall I give you. What shall I give you? Man, I'm so grateful he asked Solomon that, not me. Man, I want a Bentley. I want a, Ro- I want a Rolex watch for every month. <laughs> Lots of money, gold and silver. You don't need any of that. You just need God. And he'll give you all that. But let me tell you something. He says to God, if you keep reading, God, I'm, I'm a young guy. I don't know what I'm doing. There's so many people here. And he says, I need your wisdom. And God was like shocked. What a test. His steel had been so, saw. He saw what he was made of. And he says, because you asked me for wisdom, I will give you the wisdom, but I'll also give you the gold and silver because you didn't ask for it, you're going to get it anyway. Because that's our God, he's abundant. Tonight, my dear friends, it's not easy, but I find that there's lots of testings that are gonna require hard choices. Let me go through them quickly and we'll conclude. Number one, God permits temptations, even though they may seem unjust and unfair. Number two, God permits man to suffer at times, even though it's crazy and you don't know why. But man, hang in there. God will get you through. Number three, God permits and requires hard tasks. You don't know how you're going to make it, but he makes it for you. You didn't know how we're going to build this place but he built it. Number four, God often requires deep sacrifice. It's a test to see where you'll go, what you'll do. As Abraham was standing above his son, ready to plunge the knife in and kill him and offer him up as a burnt sacrifice, God shows up through an angel and says, stop. And then he makes this fascinating say. He says, now I know which means I was testing you to see your steel. (laughs) Sacrifices. Number five, God often requires hard journeys. It's not smooth. Smooth roads are for sissies. Journeys of God are hard, but he's there with you. And it's a road worth traveling. Number six, that God requires man to make hard choices. Tonight, when you're surprised by the things that happen in your life, or tomorrow, or next week, or next month, or next year, just know you're not alone. And know that great men and great women have all been tested just like you. And your future lies in what you're made of. 
Because iron wants to sharpen iron. If God spoke to you tonight, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. Can you do that? <laughs>